I want to move us now to a discussion uh, with yourself and, and other leaders in the field around the future of maternal, newborn, and child health innovation in the coming decade, now that we've reviewed some of the lessons learned from the last few years. And I want to introduce uh, Deepika Devdas from Grand Challenges Canada, who is going to serve as the moderator for this discussion. So Deepika and all of our discussants and panelists, thank you so much for making time to join and over to you. Thank you for that, Krishna. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. And uh, we will hear more from Tori in this next session as well. Um, to briefly introduce myself, I'm Deepika Devdas from Grand Challenges Canada, Program Officer of the Every Woman, Every Child Innovation Marketplace, uh, an innovation support platform supported by GCC, the Gates Foundation, NORAD, and USAID and within the UN architecture of the Every Woman, Every Child initiative. Um, and the role of this initiative in this ecosystem has been to provide hands-on advisory support to a subset of the most promising MNCH innovations, including some of the slab innovations, uh, together with the ability to navigate the over 150 um, funders and uh, investors in our networks that we have built strong relationships with. So it is through this lens that the session title about changes in the MNCH innovation space in the next decade is very apt um, because it is the countdown decade to the SDG 2030 agenda. And we all recognize that business as usual is not going to cut it to reach our goals for maternal, newborn and child uh, mortality and morbidity indicators. And this is notwithstanding the various unforeseen pressures on MNCH uh, priorities like the current pandemic. So to discuss all of this, we are fortunate to bring together uh, as a panel, the perspectives of the various stakeholders invested in MNCH progress. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of you panelists to please introduce yourselves with your name and organization and to make it less cliched your role in the larger MNCH ecosystem as well. Uh, and so in addition to Tori, who you've just heard from, we'll go around this virtual table, starting with Dr. Edward Peter Akwete. Thank you, Deepika. Um, Edward Peter Akwate, I'm the country director for Elizabeth Laser Pediatric AIDS Foundation in Uganda, um, EGPAF. Um, I've been working in, in, um, in the field uh, to scale up uh, HIV prevention and treatment programs. And while we have a heavy focus on preventing mother-child transmission of HIV, you know, we've really got to realize that uh, we, can't, we can't do that within a weak maternal and child health uh, environment. So uh, we've been working in the innovation space to test out effective programming uh, that's going to help bring good quality maternal and child health services um, in the countries where we work. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Edward. I hope people are finding it okay to hear and hearing. Um, Megan had a hard time hearing, but hopefully people are able to hear. So thank you, Edward. Those are help, helpful. And uh, over to you, Dr. Zolfi Bhatta. Me, I can't unmute myself. Yeah, thank you. So, so thank you very much, and uh, uh, I'm glad I was able to join, uh, albeit a little late. So, firstly, congratulations on getting things to this stage. So, um, I think one of the big challenges in the MNCH innovation space, something that we might discuss, is really how to get these very interesting and exciting ideas up to scale how to get them truly integrated into the health systems within low and middle income countries. Something that the vast majority of innovations uh, that people work on are unable to do. And therefore, to some extent, a study of exemplars as to what are the exemplary innovations in recent years where uh, there has been true progress, game-changing interventions, and what are the attributes of those approaches that one can emulate when you're looking at different challenges. 
So I'll start with uh, the challenge of, uh, of tackling birth asphyxia, resuscitating newborn babies. I'm a neonatologist and I can relate to this being a huge challenge even 40 years ago when I started clinical work on this in a low and middle income country where uh, the big challenges and barriers in terms of implementation were not just the fact that these deliveries were taking place in the wrong place, that many of them were in facilities without adequate equipment or staff who were trained, but uh, they were also uh, very uh, hampered or impeded by uh, issues that we had around equipment, uh, technology, training, quality, standards, and I recall that uh, at the level of the agencies, global agencies, normative agencies like WHO, although this was on the radar screen for a very long time, there was very little positive movement in the direction until innovation came along in, in, the, uh, in the face of um, simplifying processes making them also available at low cost and at scale. And I'm not saying that just because Thor is on the panel, but I think the, the work that the Laird Al Foundation has done and, and the American Academy in terms of uh, developing a Helping Babies Breathe program, which frankly became viral. It became viral because it was simple, simple to understand as an innovation in terms of packaging things that we all knew, but had complicated by developing complicated protocols and algorithms for handling something which was reasonably basic. I think those were the game changing things. Today, when I look at the global landscape to say how much progress has been made just within the last decade on improving newborn resuscitation at scale in facilities, whether I'm dealing with rural parts of South Asia, India, Pakistan, Northern Asia, uh, and what we could not do 30 years ago, the major difference is is simplification, innovation around algorithms and training of people and making equipment available that doesn't just die with the, uh, with the passage of time within five or six months. So the bottom line in all of this is that in the technology and innovation pathway, going from concept to proof of principles, to uh, implementation at some reasonable level of effectiveness and then scale, it's, a, it's not a happenstance, it just doesn't happen by chance. This is a process that needs to be very thoughtful, purposive from the very outset. And some of the barriers that you will get into, get to face with any technology or innovation have to be thought out from the very outset. So as a you know, slab and, and grand challenges uh, evaluator and uh, supporter, I, I think, looking at the framework of how innovations can be truly evaluated on those standards of cost benefit analysis, feasibility, sustainability, and importantly, fulfilling demand factors that we see on the ground are critically important. So let me stop at that, but those are just some of the preliminary thoughts on how your evaluation work as part of this exercise and what the global landscape shows is also teaching us how not to do, how not to make the mistake, not to make the mistakes that we have made over the last several decades going forward. We still have plenty of challenges around other major killers of newborns, uh, prematurity being a major one, adequate detection and management of infections being a third, and we haven't yet begun tackling many of the morbidities that affect newborns, whether they relate to issues around thermoregulation or hyperbilirubinemia. There are many uh, challenges that lie ahead, but the big three, I think we have now begun to get our teeth into. Thank you. Excellent. That was Dr. Zulfi Bhatta, yeah. whose uh, expertise we have called upon time and time again. Um, thank you for those insights. Um, moving again to through the introductions again, uh, maybe I can ask Dr. Elizabeth Kirapa to briefly introduce herself. Thank you. Um, so my, my name is uh, Elizabeth Akira Pakiracho. I'm a senior lecturer at Makere University School of Public Health, and I'm also a researcher who does quite a bit of work um, related to increasing access to maternal health services. And I'm also particularly interested in seeing these services 
um, or interventions improve service delivery and improve health outcomes for these particular um, women and newborns. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next, we have Elena Orly Hodges. Sorry about that delay in my mute button. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on this panel. My name is Alina Early Hodges. I'm an assistant director of programs at the Duke Global Health Innovation Center. Um, and you know, through our center and being an academic entity, our our vision is a world where innovation improves health for all. And through this, we're to achieve this vision. You know, we're we are you know, fully dedicated and committed to generating evidence on what works um, and what doesn't, um, and so that we can accelerate the, the uptake and, and access to high quality, low cost um, health products and services um, so that um, we can reach those who the most with these interventions. Um, I lead the Launch and Scale speedom Speedometer um, Initiative through the Global Health Innovation Center, and this initiative is generating evidence and building a public platform um, to track the latest data um, on what it takes uh, for interventions in the maternal and health uh, in the maternal and health space to, to move from this proof of concept or ideation phase to regulatory approvals and then ultimately to scale up in, in various populations. So we're tracking not only those pathways that these interventions take to get to people, but also what is the time that it takes for these interventions to ultimately reach people. So um, I think Tori presented a great uh, snapshot of that time frame, but um, you know, we continue to add to that evidence base uh, of the time, but also understanding the key factors uh, that contribute to their launch and scale. So I think it's uh, Dr. Booth had mentioned you know, the, these key characteristics, these key attributes um, that are so critical to introduction and scale up. And so we're, we're taking a deeper dive into understanding that um, the data set will also soon include the saving lives at birth innovations. So this entire um, portfolio of innovations that we've been studying over the last decade or so um, will be included. And so we're excited to build on the evidence um, that has come out of the evaluation reports and the evaluation activities. Um, and just look forward to, to generating um, additional insights from, from all of this great work that everyone's been doing. So thanks again. Excellent, great to have you. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Marianne Etibet. Over to you, Marianne. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great, thank you, Deepika, and thank you so much for inviting me to be on this forum. So I'm the lead of Merck for Mothers. Uh, we are Merck's $500 million commitment to helping ensure uh, no woman has to die while giving birth. And one of the ways that we seek to help accelerate this journey from innovation to impact that we've heard so much about this morning is also to innovate in the financing space um, and to bring new and different types of capital, uh, specifically private capital, uh, to help bridge that valley of death uh, so that innovators have access to new types of cap capital to take them to scale and sustainability. Excellent. And on that note, finally, we have uh, John Simon. Uh, thank you, Devika. I had a little problem with the unmute button myself, and, and thanks to Duke for organizing this great conference. I'm John Simon, the managing partner of Total Impact Capital. We're an impact investing firm that focuses on basic human needs and developing impact uh, investment products uh, in partnership with uh, uh, our implementers on the ground. In the health space, we work very closely with the Farm Access Foundation and the Medical Credit Fund. And in the MNCH space, we're working as uh, uh, also in partnership with Marianne and Merck for Mothers on a, uh, a product uh, to help uh, uh, incentivize uh, uh, journeys through maternity th through something called mom care uh, using digital technology uh, and uh, uh, the safe care standards which are the uh, clinical standards that farm access has developed and also in the recent or the recent COVID crisis we're heavily focused on providing financing to health facilities through the medical credit fund 
uh, to help them deal with the uh, fall in revenues that's resulted at, through both lockdowns and through people staying away from uh, uh, health facilities. And one effort we're trying to do to create confidence for people to come back to health facilities is creating a, uh, uh, a COVID safe badge, if you will, through safe care that would let patients know that the facilities have taken all the best practices to control infections uh, and create a safe environment in, in the, in the, with the current crisis. Thank you, John. Uh, this is clearly a very amazing and uh, comprehensive panel. Thank you all and pleasure to have you all with us today. Um, so let's get started uh, and probably uh, starting with you, Edward, um, with a question on hopefully the short term future, COVID-19. Um, from a local actor's perspective, what have you seen in terms of uh, the effect of COVID-19 on MNCH priorities, uh, as well as on government partnerships? Yeah, uh, thank you, Deepika, for that question. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to restrictions on travel, but also on the social interactions, which are critical for uh, healthcare, especially you know, primary health care that the maternal and child health space depends on. Uh, we've also seen a major shift of health system resources to the COVID-19 response. Uh, that has inevitably led to especially the primary health care component of MCH services being deprioritized as more resources are shifted to COVID-19. And so we, we've, we've also seen uh, case management uh, taking a back seat. Uh, so it's not only just the primary health care services that have taken, uh, uh, have suffered, but then also uh, tertiary, uh, especially secondary and some tertiary care for maternal and child health services. So apart from, so if I may give an example, uh, apart from shortages in basic uh, personal protective supplies, uh, you know, from your basic gloves to face masks, uh, the need for health workers to establish whether clients are safe enough for them to examine, uh, and a counter perception amongst the general public that the health facilities are not safe for them because that's where all the sick people go to, has led to reduced uptake of maternal and child health services. Uh, and we've seen this uh, more especially so at the lower level, small health facilities in the communities. Uh, we've also seen a shift uh, in, in short-term investments in some of the, you know, the low-cost uh, technologies, uh, appliances for community health workers, because all the available money is going in uh, for COVID, the COVID-19 response. Um, and so, so, so that's, that's had a real quick impact uh, on, on, on the services in our experience. And, and we've also seen some health facilities not being available for all but the very ill patients uh, with life-threatening uh, conditions. Um, the, um, the, other, you know, the, the other aspect we're seeing is in terms of the way uh, governments, governments perceive implementing partners like us on the ground. Uh, once there's an emergency, everyone expects express us all to drop what we are doing and chip in, in in terms of helping manage that emergency. So, so while we've been used to, uh, to dealing with public health emergencies uh, of a different kind, uh, you know, more long-term types of emergencies and epidemics, I think COVID-19 has changed that paradigm significantly uh, in, in such a way that it threatens some of the SDGs and other more universal or global goals that we've been trying to achieve. Thank you, Edward. Those are helpful but worrying insights, something we will need to factor in as a community going forward. Um, our next uh, question for Elizabeth, as one of our experts in health systems policy and government engagement, what do you feel are the changes that need to be made in MNCH funding as it exists today to ensure government adoption, often a crucial outcome to get to the bottom of the pyramid populations? Okay, um, thank you for, for that question. Um, I think I want to focus on four suggestions. 
and really focusing on um, low and middle income countries as I think about that. One of the things I want to propose is that funders should strive to fund innovations that are aligned with government strategic plans and that address um, country priority local needs because governments will certainly be interested in finding innovations that are meeting their priority needs. And that therefore means that engagement with the government throughout the process becomes key. But the second thing I'd like to propose is that uh, many governments do not participate a lot um, in these kind of calls when they're there. And so funders could encourage more public-private partnerships during the applications, and this could be done through a range of options that can trigger government interest. One of them perhaps is creating more innovation hubs in, in low income countries that can expose people to the potential of innovations to improve service delivery or improve outcomes. So this would mean that governments can also put in um, applications in collaboration with the private sector, in collaboration with universities, and this may promote the development of more um, contextually relevant interventions that uh, can easily fit into the care pathway and that could um, possibly be supported by governments later. Um, thirdly, I think there should also be more funds dedicated to innovative service delivery approaches. Um, part of um, the results from the SLAB evaluation showed that just about 16% of the funding was going to service delivery approaches. But we know that many governments, especially in low and middle income countries, struggle with successful delivery of already known interventions. And so trying to fund interventions, um, um, service delivery approaches of these interventions um, that can result in savings with regard to human resource, um, with regard to time, financial resources, while increasing productivity and improving outcomes will also spark and draw more interest from government and could result in continued funding. And um, lastly, I think if more funding to support scaling up can be done in collaboration with governments and can require governments to also contribute to the scale up with um, eventually expecting that the government can take over part of that funding that we may also see more adoption. Um, however, when we think about that, the amount of additional resources that are required um, need to be um, moderate, knowing that many governments are resource constrained, especially in low income settings and have um, a number of competing priorities. So those are some of um, the, the actions that I think um, if, if funders tried to take up within um, the funding space for MNCH could help us see more government adoption of some of these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent insights, uh, Dr. Kirapa. Um, moving now to Alina to get the perspective of the main actors uh, deploying innovative solutions who are the innovators. Uh, Alina, from your perspective of uh, innovator support and reflection from this lab report itself, uh, what are some of the biggest takeaways in terms of changes that need to be made and how, how the funders support innovators? Thanks for, for that question and I'll, I'll tie into what Elizabeth just commented um, with regard to, you know, both both the government perspective and, and thinking of scale up um, and sustainability. But I, I first want to mention that, you know, through our launch and scale speedometer, you know, we continue to collect, um, you know, the evidence for, for what it takes to scale up and the timeframes for those scale ups. And through our research, you know, we've identified that many of these innovations are taking on average between five and 10 years to move from sort of an ideation phase, development phase to, uh, you know, just to proof of concept. So, you know, understanding the effectiveness of the innovation in populations. And so that time frame is really significant. And we recognize that a lot of funding has been going to that earlier stage, you know, to get get innovations and innovators through that first valley of death. Um, so I think that there is, um, you know, we don't, we don't see the impact of these innovations. I think as Joy Noel noted in the earlier panel, we don't see that impact until these 
organizations are actually scaled um, in, you know, in different countries and, and actually reaching people. So what I would like for funders to focus on is to, you know, continue supporting the entire continuum of, of introduction and scale up from the R&D phase through the scale up phase. So I think we can't forget about the, the need for funding um, in that scale up component of this work. Um, and then to Elizabeth's point, I think my second comment would be around, um, you know, recognizing that that these innovators and innovations, we need to understand their their impact and, you know, whether it's from an outcomes perspective or whether it's understanding their cost effectiveness. Um, and I think that governments make a lot of their decisions um, and their procurement decisions, their partnership decisions based on, you know, those outcomes and understanding of that impact of these, these innovations. And so if funders could, you know, consider allocating financial support to um, helping innovators, you know, uh, research the impact of their innovations, I think that that will be um, a really important uh, step in the right direction, especially from a scale and sustainability perspective. So governments taking up more of these interventions. Uh, certainly funding could, could also support that scale up phase as well. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, that uh, measuring impact is really critical. And then finally, um, I know this is repeating a little bit from earlier, but I really do feel like funders need to be looking at more of those innovations from, you know, from LMICs. So I think it's really important um, that we're, we're addressing and, and looking to those innovations that are coming from, uh, from, local, from the local context and they, they really recognize uh, the, the local needs and, um, and the importance of, of designing from that perspective. So um, I think funding going towards supporting more innovators in that space is really important. Um, we've also seen through some of our work that, um, and I think someone mentioned this earlier, but that, um, you know, we don't need to recreate what's already been what's already been developed in these spaces. So through some of our research, we've been seeing that these um, innovations, you know, there's only been slight refinements made um, to some of these innovations that are coming out of the global south. But the the um, the high income country um, innovators are the ones being funded, where you know maybe the original innovation came from the global south. So um, I just want to you know sort of make that my final point that that's really important. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Alina. And <clears throat> I'm being asked to uh, wrap this up a little quicker. So perhaps moving more quickly to Marianne and maybe focusing, Marianne, on the access to life-saving innovation uh, solutions that uh, Merck focuses on, as well as, uh, you know, the innovative financing piece that you brought up. Are there mechanisms we can use to increase that access? Sure, thank you, Dipika. So just you know, to quickly share the Merck for Mothers lessons learned <coughs> as we've tried to bridge public and private financing, uh, you know, to bring more capital to this space and to do, as Alina said, be able to fund that whole continuum. I would say the three lessons we've learned, the first one is simplify, simplify, simplify. Uh, when we think about the innovation, it's not just the innovation that has to be simple, it's the innovation plus. The innovation plus deployment, the innovation plus adoption, the innovation plus integration, you know, that D delivery that Tor mentioned, that whole package has to be simple. You know, I don't know any of you, but, you know, when I get an instructions manual of, you know, how to, you know, add some technology to my TV, if it's 10 pages, I don't do it, <laughs> you know? So I, I think that we, we really need to extend that idea of simplification, which is necessary for replication. And that replication, that success of replication is necessary for scale. And that's where you're going to see the return on investment, both the social impact investment, as well as the financial investment. The second point is around data. And I think these innovations need to be linked to data and data systems. And so we're, we're able to understand results in real time. Um, and so that as investors, we're able to understand, uh, you know, um, the, we're able to compare, uh, you know, results across potential investments, not just within maternal health, 
or within health, but between health and other impact sectors. And the third one is focus on the experience of the customer, the woman, the patient. I think when that experience of care is transformative, uh, that's where you're going to see the real sustainability, um, uh, you know, real sustainability come through. Um, and, and that, again, uh, is where we all want to go uh, when we're thinking about impact. Excellent. Thank you, Marianne. And uh, very quickly to our last panelist, John, um, on that financing topic, can you speak to us a little bit about, we hear time and time again about patient capital. Can capital for MNCH really afford to be patient? And what's that going to take from stakeholders? So when you look at the business models that exist in the MCH space, I think that not only uh, uh, can capital afford to be patient, but it's a necessity that it be patient. You don't see a lot of business models that have a very high, quick returning multiple. So basically, what you need to do is find capital that is interested in the impact as well as the financial return, uh, sees it as a long-term strategic uh, or social investment, uh, and is willing to take some time to, to, to receive its return. And the good news is that uh, there is a lot of that type of capital out there. It's, it, there. There's a growing pool of money that's looking for strong impact. It's coming from not just uh, uh, high net worth individuals, but also from several institutional investors. And the real constraint is uh, um, implementable, uh, scalable opportunities. And that's really where the focus needs to be on in terms of creating opportunities that deliver impact, delivered in a sustainable way, and can achieve uh, a significant change in, in, in the system. And that's really the focus uh, that I think we all have to look at if we're going to mobilize the capital that's, that's looking to come into the sector. Excellent. Thank you for that very quick answer there, John. Um, and so I'll, I'll conclude this quickly. Again, apologies for the, the time crunch here, but we've heard from our brilliant panelists for sharing their uh, unique perspectives and helping us chart a way for, the, for MNCH moving forward. Uh, and we can all agree this has certainly been an illuminating discussion. Um, um, over to you, Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepika, and all of our esteemed speakers and panelists. Uh, fantastic perspectives, and as always, more information, more, um, more possible uh, discussion than time. Uh, so I apologize also for, uh, for having to move on uh, in terms of time. We've come to the end of our, uh, our session.